Thank you. Um, yesterday, uh, Dr. Portner, um, when he talked about uh, fluid dynamics analysis of uh, bicycles, giving the company a strong lead, uh, edge, I thought uh, I mentioned another example, uh, which I thought uh, before I start my talk, uh, uh, I'll, I'll mention. Uh, Speedo, the laser uh, swimsuit, uh, won 23 out of 24 world records at the Beijing Olympics, yeah. uh, people who wore it. Uh, in fact, uh, that's what, what they did was uh, uh, Speedo USA, right? Um, they got swimmers and they, flew, uh, they float water over it. So this is like a wind tunnel, but it's fluid. And then they noticed palpitation on the skin that created drag. So they uh, 3D modeled uh, top swimmers and then draped them with material and used fluent fluid dynamics applications uh, to run these simulations. And worked actually with NASA on materials. Yeah, giving you an edge, right? National edge. And uh, they came up with the LZR swimsuit laser. The areas, silver areas are hard to shape the body, and black is uh, highly smooth. Yeah. Uh, basically, to try and create a particular shape of the body. Yeah. And that's Michael Phelps swimming. He actually swims like a fish, uh, you can see. Beautiful, right? Yeah. You can see that. <laughs> From far, it looks like a fish. Yeah. Anyway, um, so there were people who objected. They call it technological doping during the Beijing Olympics. The Olympics officials disagreed and allowed all the records. Uh, although after the Olympics, FINA banned it, and, and Speedo had to uh, rejigger the, uh, the laser swimsuit to, to get it uh, uh, to recomply. Uh, so basically today, uh, you couldn't buy it during the Olympics. Uh, only uh, uh, United States team, Team USA, and allies can buy it. Uh, and, uh, and after the Olympics, uh, they charge 500 bucks for it, but today you can buy one for 395, yeah. Right. There we go, that's the story. Uh, they, they did it on our system, yes. Uh, the, the men's swimsuit now uh, does not, is, is not allowed to have the top, it, on, only the bottom. That's part of the FINA compliance, yeah. So they can use it now. Oh, by the way, uh, Rene uh, asked if I would uh, wear it on stage today, just to get a kick, yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like I'm 5,000 sit-ups away from it, you know? <laughs> Apparently, it takes you about 45 minutes to put it on. Anyway, okay. Um, extreme scale, big data. I thought I'll uh, uh, bring up some workflow examples uh, from people we've worked with. Essentially, big data for many is this. It's not that it didn't exist before, but it did exist in different silos, in different departments for themselves, but never quite uh, have someone standing back looking at all the silos and try to correlate the data to get new information out. I think this is, a, a, this is one way to describe big data for many of the workflow examples that we've seen. Let's have a look at some. The first stage is to ingest the data. Uh, we've been ingesting gigabytes per day, coming up to terabytes a day. Uh, we have examples of petabyte per day. And later, I'll show you an example of one exabyte a day. I almost fell off my chair, but uh, we'll come back to that later. Right? Ingest the data. And the sources of these ingests are typically, uh, the biggest one is HPC to start with. Uh, we are familiar with that. I thought I used the NOAA example in this case. Uh, essentially, uh, this is a slight credit to NOAA. Uh, they, they drape the earth uh, with a layer above uh, the ground, right? Of course, ocean is important, but they drape it uh, with a grid. You have X and Y. So you have X and Y here, and then you have the Z, which is the depth. Right. And if you look at the 100 kilometers XY uh, grid, uh, NOAA GFDL uh, at 100 kilometers grid. So each grid is 100 kilometers. Uh, they run this across the entire globe uh, to look at uh, uh, surface temperatures yeah, going out to the year 2100. This is part of the IPCC run. Uh, that uh, Zeng Dali mentioned yesterday. Right. Areas in red are supposed to be hotter than today, uh, blue cooler than today. Right. You can imagine uh, the amount of data a GFDL has produced. I think it's 40 petabyte over the last uh, maybe six years. Uh, that's right, Dale. About six years, they generated 40 petabyte of these model data. Yeah. Coming up to 2100 now. And... Uh, for those who trust their simulation, it's probably a good time to start buying up land in Portland, Oregon. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> right. So from 100 kilometers, from 200 kilometers to 100 kilometers, which was the one you saw before, to 50 kilometers, 
down to 25 kilometers, right? Um, that's about 250 times uh, increase in computational power and data if you want to store it. And that's not counting uh, uh, resolution increase in the Z direction, not counting it, and not counting uh, time step resolution increase. So 250 is very conservative, right? It's only X and Y, 2X, yeah? Uh, and you can already see uh, the type of problems you're facing. But even at 25 kilometers, we are far from real. This is observed data. You can see that we're still quite hazy and blur at 25 kilometers compared to radar observations. Right? And this one is credit to NOAA. So we have to get tighter in our simulation. This is big, not counting uh, Z and time. right? But this is still not enough at 25. So let's have a look at uh, uh, National Severe Storm Laboratory, NSSL, which uh, you, uh, is reducing from 25 kilometer down to 4 kilometer. See, much tighter grid. On the left is the simulation. On the right is the radar. And it's getting there. In fact, this was a classic example when I went to uh, um, Oklahoma uh, during, uh, at the weather center during one of the tornado season. You'll notice that during that uh, tornado season, uh, one of the radar failed. You can see there is a clip here. There's no data here. Right? You can see that there is a clip. Because that radar failed, you can see no data. So it's, it turns out that uh, the simulation had data, and they used the simulation data to patch the radar data. So it's a flip, right, uh, in this case. So it turns out that simulation is getting better. But then at four kilometers, you can't afford to do it across the entire Earth. It'll be too much data. Right? That was four kilometer, That was 25 meters down to four kilometers. Now we have one that was done at Oklahoma University with Pittsburgh, down to, this is 25 meters. 0.025 kilometer. All right. This is an actu actual tornado uh, simulation. The initial conditions uh, came about from radar measurements, and then they run the simulation to try and run ahead of the tornado to find out where the touchdown point is and the path of that, uh, of that touchdown point because that's where the destruction occurs. But the point is, as you get down to these resolutions, you can't afford to do it across a big area. They can only afford to do it for one cloud. And this cloud already generated 60 terabytes of data for 30 minutes of the cloud run. One simulation, 60 terabytes, yeah, because of the resolution. That's still not good enough. Uh, they went one up further from 25 meters down to 12 meters. And uh, it's pretty dramatic. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty dramatic. So all this is just uh, increasing data. Hundreds of terabytes are generated uh, from these. Yeah? And that's the reason why you see uh, data growth at just one of the NOAA site, uh, 40 petabytes today. And you can see uh, uh, a few drops, and this is where they cleaned up their data, but it grew again. Right? Um, so NOAA grew at about uh, two times the amount of data every year, but they had to bring it down. So what they did is they deleted all the intermediate data and only kept the raw and the results, and deleted the intermediate. And say, if you needed the intermediate, they'll recompute. You can see you reach that stage that uh, you, know, you have to delete data. And they got it down from 2x growth every year to 2x growth every 18 months. So at least they are on Moore's law now. So that's a strategy. Stay on Moore's law. Uh, at least uh, the computer industry can help you. So this is the, the sources of big data HPC on the ingest side. Social network. It's another area of uh, big data generator where we are involved with. This is Twitter, collecting during the elections uh, all Twitter data. Uh, I think Romney is in blue, Obama in red, uh, President Obama. Uh, sorry, the other way. Uh, Romney is in red, uh, President Obama in blue. And uh, live feeds of all the Twitter's data is being brought into a single coherent memory uh, and visualization software applied uh, in real time. And then uh, Caliph uh, uh, does sampling of some of the tweets and bring it up. Yeah. So ability to ingest massive amount of data. Actually, the quantity of data is not high. The volume isn't high. It's just that the velocity of uh, messages are high. Right? The volume isn't high because each tweet is uh, pretty limited in text, uh, amount of text. Yeah. Uh, next one is YouTube. We used to supply systems to YouTube. Um, just as a site uh, interest, uh, um, uh, Jennifer Lopez has the third highest viewership on YouTube. 0.6 billion views 
Imagine that for that one video. Who's second? Any guesses? Justin Bieber, 0.8 billion. <laughs> Anyone wants to guess drum roll, number one? Yeah, Gundam style, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Sai got $8 million from YouTube, yeah. Uh, so basically, he got half a cent for every view. So at 1.3 billion views, he, he got about 8 million bucks, yeah. Right. So you can actually make money. You just have to be interesting. Huh? <laughs> the thing is, uh, YouTube has roughly uh, about uh, 100,000 hours of videos uh, uh, inserted a day. That works out if you just estimate it as a megabit stream. I mean, some are larger, of course. Uh, this works out to roughly about 50 terabytes of data to 100 terabytes of data a day. So that's velocity for you, right? But then they also have volume. They have three, already 3 billion videos uh, stored. Uh, that's of an order of tens of petabytes, uh, depending on how big those videos are. So you have velocity and volume here. After social, uh, the, the, the next one is sensor. This one is growing. If you ask me, this one is going to be the big one. If we have problems on HPC, we have problems on social, this one is going to be big. Right? Let's uh, look at some uh, examples we've been working with. Uh, this is uh, the solar observatory by NASA. Uh, that's, that's the sun. And that's the size of the Earth, roughly. Uh, NASA sent up a satellite with four HD cameras watching the sun. And uh, pretty dramatic pictures. The idea is if the uh, solar flares, those actually can hurt uh, communications and uh, the Earth. right? If the solar flare travels to Earth less than the speed of, of light, of course, then we can get a warning. Because the satellite can then send us a warning. Yeah. So that's the whole uh, part of the idea. So there's a, set, a bunch of satellite dishes collecting this data daily, send it through to Stanford University for processing. Uh, next one is NBA. Yeah, I'd be wondering why NBA. Any basketball fans here? No? Yeah. yeah, there we go. Yes. Every basketball game. Oh, excuse me a second. Yeah, every basketball game, there are nine uh, HD cameras watching that game. Court side, there is someone actually uh, annotating metadata real time, who got the ball, who took the shot, and so on. So this metadata recorded by voice is synchronized with the videotapes uh, world clock time, and then they have half a million videotapes in their library. That's volume for you. So if someone wanted uh, you know, uh, uh, Kobe Bryant that took a shot three months ago, um, that someone actually has to go into the tape library, pick out the Kobe Bryant ones, right? carry it literally, this is in New Jersey, carried literally to a cutting room, and then that someone uh, actually had to then pull uh, the Kobe Bryant pieces out to create an MPEG file. So that wouldn't work. So what we did is to digitize all that half a million videotape and put it onto uh, in digital, and then create a, and NBA created a web uh, page that says, Kobe Bryant took shots three months ago, execute. And the, the system goes in and pulls out all the right pieces, creates an MPEG file, uh, NBA sells it for 50 bucks, yeah. and they've been making a lot of money. Yeah. Turns out that the biggest buyers are the competitive teams trying to study the players. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And then they're so happy with it, they said, okay, uh, uh, SGI, you know, I have another half million videotapes in the warehouse of my 40 years of archive of basketball games. Could you do it for us? There's a very happy sales guy in, uh, on, in New Jersey at the moment. Yeah. Right. So that's volume for you because the velocity isn't that high. I mean, each game you've got four, uh, nine HD cameras isn't as high, uh, but the, the, the volume is massive, right? So volume and velocity, you can see. Uh, and another new area is DNA sequences. They are coming up to about a terabyte a day, and there are about 2,000 sequences in the world. Uh, Broad Institute probably has some of the world's most. I think they have, I don't know, 100 plus uh, in the US. Um, but all over the world, about 2,000, yeah. Uh, the other area that is of growing interest is microscopes. You know, I visited a lab uh, uh, by a former MIT prof professor, and uh, he showed me this tabletop microscope that he built, all right? Yeah, he gave me permission to video it. This PC here is rated in order to get that data in, and, and he uses laser to uh, illuminate uh, the biological cells, and then the camera is then used, very, very high-speed camera. This is the one that is used then to record the uh, images in 3D at uh, a gigabyte per second. 
that works out to be about uh, 50 terabytes a day. So if you think a sequencer is big, this microscope alone is 50 terabytes a day. And uh, as someone yesterday spoke about, you know, uh, I think it was Zheng Dali, uh, who mentioned that uh, individual labs are not coping with these data. That's why they called us in. Yeah. So we're glad to help. Yeah. Now, uh, I close by, on this part by the uh, grand champion of big data, Jed Rater. Uh, I was called to Australia three years ago, uh, and, and when I arrived, and they said, uh, uh, we're going to build an instrument that will generate a lot of data. I asked how much. They said about an exabyte raw a day. <laughs> Fell off my chair, right? Uh, and essentially what they plan to do with a square kilometer array, they put one in Perth and one in uh, South Africa because of the quietness of electronics there. Um, and the idea here is to put uh, these 15 meter dishes, but 2,000 of them packed into one square kilometer, all pointing into one area of the sky, creating a massive virtual telescope. Uh, they cannot afford to store it all. Yeah? So they have to do a 100 to 1 reduction or throw away data. Very painful. I think that's one of the dilemmas of big data, right? You build a big instrument, spend a few billion dollars, but then you have to decide what data to throw away, the majority of it, right? Because you can't afford to store them all. So you have to push your processing as close to the instrument as possible to make good decisions about what to throw and what to keep. So that's the three, right? The next stage is you store and organize and you hope you throw away the right stuff and are keeping the right stuff. But there are two groups arising that do not have this reduction. One is the intelligence community. They say, I want to store everything because the one I throw may be the important one in the future. The other one are the biological microscopes. They say, I cannot throw everything and anything because I take the cell one time with this chemical. I repeat the experiment. The picture is different. I never knew it. I never realized that when uh, the professor told me this, this dilemma they have. Because the cells don't, are, are never the same right? uh, the second time round. So they have to keep everything too. Right? So although majority of the people have to make hard decisions about what to throw, uh, there are two groups that have an even harder decision as to how to store them all. That's the list. Uh, it, you know, the example I showed you, uh, some of these people touch on that. These are all the unclassified lists. Uh, the square kilometer array has bought 100 petabytes. And if they really did 100 to 1, this will only last them 10 days. When they switch on the telescope, 10 days later, switch it off. Yeah. Right. No. I mean, by the time they build the telescope, uh, we'll grow the storage space and we'll figure out better ways yeah, uh, to, to store them. Uh, NASA is at 60 and NOAA is at about 40. Yeah. So you can see this is big. And then the film industry is starting to come in here. Weather stores all the Lord of the Rings, uh, yes, Lord of the Rings movies and uh, Avatar in there. NBA, you saw that uh, just now. The ITER program for fusion reaction, reactor, Large Hadron Collider. These are all instruments. National Geographic, every time you watch National Geographic, it's coming off uh, this system, right? And so on. The oil companies are starting to come up at the bottom. And then you can see the, uh, the genomics people. So you store your data first. Uh, you, let's just say if you are a HPC person, you'll be computing your data, putting it into memory, and perhaps you have a tier that stores it in flash, and then you go to spinning disk that consumes about five watts when spinning. And then when you run out of space and you still want to keep things, many has gone to tape. And then that's basically what you have. You store everything in terms of your arrays here and everything in files there. That's typically you know, where most of our customers are. A lot of them refuse to go to tape and say, I'm going to stop here. And then they say, I'll stop here this year. Next year, they go, okay, I'll stop again. I'll, I'll stop there. But the third year, they say, oh, it's too much, expensive, right? Uh, either power uh, spills over because it's five watt per disk drive. A million disk drive is five megawatts. Huh? Think about it. You're so worried about exascale consuming 20 megawatt. Put in a million disk drive next to that exascale machine, and that will consume five megawatt. We spend so much, 100, 200, 300 million dollars trying to reduce that 30 megawatts down to 20. We pop back up another five just because we have a million disk drives on the side. Right? So spinning disk drive is a necessity. Can flash overcome uh, their uh, cost to take over? Um, maybe. 
but uh, the question is tape, right? What do we do if you refuse to go to tape? Well, uh, this is what we did. Because of all the feedback, we decided to add a tier where we actually power off the drive. So you have a million disk drive, you know, 900,000 of them are powered off. The 100,000 of them are really still spinning, right? Uh, they hold the most frequently used data, and then through some policy, you move the data to the back, which is zero watt disk, and for many, they will remove the tape tier. Because the tape tier requires also another problem, right? It requires you minutes for you to get the data back if you need it. So the zero watt drive can do better. So this is what uh, um, uh, it, it looks like. I'm just going to do a quick demo. I hope it comes up. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's a great question. So therefore, I'm going to do a demo to show it to you. Okay? <laughs> so uh, this is what uh, we'll, we'll do. I have uh, my own directory that has all my files in Linux, right? And there's this column that says REG means this file is on spinning disk, consuming 5 watt or more. The OFL means that file, based on some policy, maybe has not been touched for a while and has been relegated to switched off disk. So, so if I ask for a file that is on spinning disk, the A dot that, right? I'm going to hit return soon. I haven't. A dot that. And it's on regular means it's on spinning disk. Of course, it comes immediately because it's on spinning disk. So therefore, to answer your question, uh, how long does it take? I'm going to time it for a file that is on zero watt disk. I haven't hit return yet. Seldom dot that, right? Seldom dot that is on OFL. Means uh, some time ago, seldom dot that through some policy was moved to the switched off drives. So now I'm going to hit return and see how long uh, it takes. Actually, I was told by marketing never to do such a demo, right? Because sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> so it's not here yet. So this is the price you are paying for saving your half megawatt to five megawatts, right? It's still not here yet. It's still not here yet. So but how long before the sign up? Oh, there we go. It took about 15 seconds, right? To power up the drive, make sure it reaches the right speed, copy it over, and then bring it to you. So for the wait of 15 seconds for some of your seldom touched file, you need to ask yourself whether it's worth it to save that half megawatt to five megawatt, depending on how many disk drives you have. This is causing a few people to think. Uh, and this came about because of the early adopters telling us that this is needed. And instead of having to wait two, three minutes, now you wait 15 seconds if it is uncontended. So there are a few things here to think about, right? Now you may have an option. Mm -hmm. You may have an option, right, to have zero watt disk, where if you buy a 100,000 disk drive, we've got a customer called us up, buy, say, can I order a 100,000 disk drive from you? Uh, but I can't afford half megawatt to power it, right? Uh, power it off and keep 10, 15, 20% of your drive spinning, you decide. You can keep 100% if you want, and you're back to the usual case, the normal case, but now you can power them off and perhaps do away with the tape. But uh, a lot of them came back and say, I still would like to have a tape hard copy, hard tape copy uh, uh, as, my, as my true backup. Yeah. So this is something new uh, that may become a necessity as we go to Exascale and big data retention. Yeah, because we are thinking of those uh, people who say, I cannot throw even a single bit away. Yeah. OK, uh, so basically it looks like this. You have a tray with a, a lot of disks packed very tight, but all of, most of them are switched off. You put them in a rack, that's about two petabyte, and then you have uh, 100,000 of them, right? And, but uh, most of them are switched off. Uh, a bunch of them are on uh, based on some policy. We have a customer that uh, has so far, over the six years, ordered a million, half a million disk drives from us. And if all those disk drives are still there, uh, it, is gonna, it, it will be 2.5 megawatt of power. Just disk drive, not, not the server, right? Just a spinning disk drive, 5 watt each, is 2.5 megawatt. And you will see uh, that the newcomers in green have all ordered their zero watts. The, the genomics people especially, these two are genomics, right? And that's the square kilometer array. Uh, most of them have tape, but they have added an extra tier in front of tape 
uh, which is a zero watt drive. But it requires that hierarchical storage management software to pull, uh, based on policy, pull the right pieces of soft, uh, uh, files in. Right? So there is software required to make it work. After store and organize, uh, you have analyze. Under analyze, we have the usual uh, ones that we know of called needle in a haystack type applications. This is where you know enough about the data that is incoming. Right? You know that uh, this is uh, a bunch of images that are coming in, and you know that you're looking for a rectangle of this particular shape, right? uh, 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 an object of this particular shape. And then you're sending it into uh, looking for a needle in this huge haystack. And typically, uh, people would use a Hadoop cluster for it, because as you have heard from previous talks, you take that huge file or huge haystack or huge video uh, repository, you cut it into pieces, you sprinkle it onto nodes in a cluster, and then each node looks at uh, their own sub-haystack to look for their needle. They don't have to talk to their neighbors. That's the key in a Hadoop cluster. They don't have to talk to their neighbors. They just focus on their own haystack, look for the needle, and report it up. No talking to neighbors. Right? That's why uh, it works very well in a Hadoop cluster. And this is an example of it. Right? Uh, one customer bought 1,000 nodes, uh, do Hadoop. Uh, we've shipped something like a 10,000 notes so far, mostly to the government. Needle in a haystack type application where you know enough about your data set. Yeah? But there is another kind where you know very little about your data set. I, I have an example where you, know, you have this analyst, 30 years experience analyst, right? always focusing on his, in his desk, in his cubicle, or in his office because he's seen it enough. And then one day, uh, someone came in with a box of disk drives, dropped it on his table. He looked up at the person and said, what's this? Don't know. He opened the box up and said, oh, disk drive. So what's in the disk drive? Don't know. Right? And then, uh, where did it come from? Don't know. And what do you know? Well, all we know is the boss needs you to find something important in there because we believe it's worthwhile you spending three days on it. That's all he knows. Now, I'm talking extreme here, right? There's this whole spectrum. I'm talking about this super extreme. There are things in between. But you get that scenario. And this is where you wouldn't want to cut that data up. Even, if you, even after you manage to load that data, you wouldn't want to cut it up into pieces to put it on a cluster, right? And most likely, you're not looking for a needle in a haystack because you don't even know what needle to look for. So chances are, you're looking for relationships between hay and a stack. You'll notice that I've been using this phrase quite a lot, right? You're looking for relationships more than you're looking for a needle because you don't quite know what needle you're looking for because everything is a don't know at the moment, right? Relationships. Right? So instead of needle, you're looking for relationships. And this is one example. Uh, Caliph uh, took uh, the entire Wikipedia, downloaded it. He, he stared at it and said, don't know what I'm going to do with it. Well, well, let's connect every country mentioned together in the same year. Right? The year is at the bottom, 1880, 1890. Right? If there's a, in that year, all countries that are mentioned uh, together are connected by line. Red if the mention is negative. Green if the mention is positive. So he can answer questions like this, but he cannot do this if he starts cutting up the data to start with. So he plongs it on, uh, this last bit is to try and impress you that 2010 is a busy year. Right? Uh, he plongs it right down to a coherent memory system, single big node, big enough to carry the entire data set. And he, he sits there, use standard tools to, to work with that data right? and make discoveries. So if you had that cluster, You'll be putting that graph problem onto a cluster, and all you're doing is cutting those links up if you do it in, in the most uh, straightforward way. So it's very uh, counterproductive if you do it in a cluster. Because all you're doing here is cutting the links, right? But, but the links is what you want, right? So basically, uh, what you want is to put the entire haystack in one big, humongous memory. And that's uh, why there are two different kinds of systems depending on, and in fact, think systems in between, depending on what you need to do. Right? So that's it. If you know enough about your data set, chances are you're looking for a needle in a haystack. But a lot of times, you start out knowing very, very little about the incoming data, and you need a machine that is more flexible for you to play with that data a bit 
ultimately, hopefully, some uh, hot spots show up to ignite your curiosity to go in further. And this is where you then go to a Hadoop cluster to do uh, extraction of uh, uh, information. So that's, uh, that's the landscape. And there are things in between. As you move upstream, uh, move to the left, you, get, you need your systems to be tighter and tight, more tightly and tightly coupled. I'll show you some examples you know, from our customers that we can talk about. I can't mention uh, the postal service here, uh, but uh, this particular postal service has 2 billion transactions per day. And some people say, you know, what's the big deal? I mean, don't FedEx do more than the postal service? No. If you combine FedEx, UPS, and DHL together, their volume don't even touch uh, that by a tenth. Okay. Right. So this, this postal service have a huge uh, transaction uh, volume per day. So this is velocity for you. They don't have that much volume, massive velocity. But uh, they are getting a lot of fraud because people are copying these electronic stamps. And by the time they scan a stamp, do, go to the back, uh, batch process to find out if it is a duplicate, the, the mail is already delivered. Too late. So now they keep all uh, scan stamps uh, into a coherent memory in one place. Right? And every new stamp that comes across is checked against the 16 terabytes of memory. And if it's a duplicate, uh, they stop it there and then. ROI was three months. Yeah. Yes. And they can't use a Hadoop cluster for this, even though this is essentially a needle in a haystack, but they can't use a Hadoop cluster for this because the data is constantly updated. And Hadoop doesn't like it. So they keep a coherent memory uh, for this. Yeah. And uh, they are going bigger next. Yeah. PayPal. 15 billion transactions per day during a holiday. Yeah? Uh, PayPal, eBay together. That's even bigger uh, than the transaction rate of, uh, of uh, this postal, the previous postal co company. Right? Uh, this is the highest velocity I know, uh, short of the, uh, the square kilometer array, of course. Yeah? In terms of transaction rate, uh, this is the highest velocity I know during the holiday. And what they did is, uh, so far until now, they use a tightly coupled cluster, not using gigabit Ethernet, Hadoop cluster. They use InfiniBand because there's so much relationship going on that even they try to use the Hadoop cluster, it wouldn't work. So they switch the gigabit Ethernet out and put an InfiniBand connection in and essentially turn it into a HPC system. So they use the HPC system, a supercomputer, to do Hadoop. And then as the relationship grows, so decide to prevent a fraud. This is one user on the left, the picture the links between all the different previous and past transaction and relationships of one user, so that when the user uh, asks for a transaction on PayPal and press execute, the system actually makes a decision whether this is fraudulent or let it go. Right? You get too many false positives, you, you actually upset the customer. You get too many false negatives, you lose money. So you have to get it right. So they're going to build this relationship. So the way to get it better and right is to increase the relationship intelligence. And when they do that, and we put out a, a Hadoop cluster, even though the cluster is connected by a strong InfiniBand, uh, InfiniBand connection, it's starting to become strained. So now they have decided, uh, just got a call from, uh, from PayPal, they've decided to switch out the InfiniBand cluster to a coherent memory system. So you notice they move from the right, which is a gigabit Ethernet connected cluster, to an InfiniBand stronger, tightly coupled uh, cluster, now finally to coherent when you need to do relationships. Yeah. Because ultimately, a cluster cuts the relationship that you are trying to figure out. Yeah, you, that's what you want. Yeah. You don't want to cut that relationship. Yeah. Sounds, sounds quite human. Yeah. OK, so that's the landscape, right? So you go from here, which is a loosely coupled system, and then there is a middle tier system that is more tightly coupled using InfiniBand, but still a cluster. And ultimately, you go here if you are doing a lot of relationships. But if you're just looking for a needle and you're quite sure what needle it is, use this. It's cheaper. So this big node looks like this. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, this big node looks like this. Uh, an Apple MacBook Air mine has two Intel cores and eight gigabytes of memory, and one Mac OS X 10.8, uh, yeah? They, they call it Mountain Lion, one OS, yeah? This machine, there's one coherent memory, is essentially 4,000 cores, 64 terabytes of memory, and one instance of an OS, because you want that. 
You want the ability to load all the usual tools that are working on your laptop onto this machine and you want to run it across that big memory for that huge haystack that you, that you do not want to cut up. And then finally, this is how it looks like. If you are more on the relationship, or if, let's just say you're more on the needle side, which the world is much more familiar with, using a Hadoop cluster, you are tending in your analysis of your analysts, right? You're tending to, that person is actually doing more top-down hypothesis testing. That means they start with the big picture because they know what this is all about. And they can build a model of that data first to do prediction because they know more about it. The queries are more directed. For example, in this marketplace, what sells well with diapers? Right? The target is a diaper. Right? They know. And then uh, you tend to do more classification in your data mining, meaning you have a target, and then you classify things to it. Right? And then your data tends to be more structured, but it may not necessarily be true. But when you know little about your data and doing relationships, you're more doing bottom up because you don't quite know what the top is. You don't know the big picture. Right? So you're doing bottom up knowledge discovery. You're trying to discover as you move up. Right? And the model tends to evolve. It doesn't come immediately. And you tend to do clustering because you don't quite know you have a target. Right? So you just drop everything in and run a data mining software to see whether you see clustering because you don't have a target. Right? And since you don't have a target, you're not asking uh, questions like, what sells well with diapers? You're just asking, what sells well together? And that's data. So in data mining, depending on uh, which field you are in in data science, you know, you'll be coming across these different names. Right? That's why you hear structured, unstructured, clustering, classification, knowledge discovery, or hypothesis testing, top down or bottom up. And I'm not saying it's hard and fast rule that these are for these, these aren't for that, but you tend to have these here. So in this situation, please give your analysts the right tools. Don't force your analysts just to use that. Give your analysts some tools, like for example, a big uh, node that is not just big, but also flexible in terms of using standard software, Linux, standard Linux software, broad flexible application with open source. So any application that runs on Linux you want it to have a very good chance they'll run on this machine, just bigger. That's the key to the success for the analyst because you don't quite know what tools you'll need. I might need Python. I might just need Grep. I might, I might need something else. You, know, you can see you want, I want everything available. I may even want Excel spreadsheets. Load a terabyte into my Excel spreadsheet and do a pivot table. Come back after lunch. Yeah? Right. Right. So uh, essentially, flexibility of tools is the key to the success here. It's not just need having it big, but you must have it using standard tools. Right? And it turns out that our biggest users here on this big machine, big memory machine, is MATLAB. It's very interesting. A lot of MIT grads, they love MATLAB. There we go. Uh, but I myself use R uh, because it's free. Right? So, uh, but it works on this machine. I just went to the open source uh, website, downloaded it, uh, installed it on this Linux system, it ran. It's just that I have 64 terabytes of memory to play with on my haystack. That's the difference. So you analyze, then you visualize. Why is visualization important for some? I know of some government customers that are saying that visualization is not necessary, and they are right. But for others, it is very important. Let's have a look. This tornado uh, that you saw from Pittsburgh's uh, Supercomputing Center and Oklahoma University is 60 terabytes. If I were to stealingly, uh, like when my grad, uh, undergraduate days, stealingly walk into the computer room where the line, precious line printer was, you know, the one that you know, keep printing in paper, if I printed it 60 terabytes out, I calculated, I would have printed 1 billion pages. I'd probably destroy more trees than a tornado, but... Uh, and if I plotted it in graph, it would be about a million. So it comes down three zeros. If I use uh, pictures, uh, moving pictures, I'll need about a thousand. I come down another three zeros. And then if I plot, uh, did it in a 3D model, if I did it in 3D model, I only need one. 
This is visualization, but you need a billion entities. This is a million, this is a thousand, this is one. I exaggerate a bit, but to, to just uh, get across the point, that every kind of visualization, they have their own purpose and their own use. But you cannot close your eyes to, for, for many, you cannot just close your eyes to all these other options and just look at text or graphs. The other two have their users too. That brings us to uh, uh, the visualization software that we have been developing called Mindset. This is multidimensional and it is meant for high density data. Let's have a look at it. Uh, so you have three dimensions, uh, occupation, education, and hours worked. And the next dimension is the color of the pay of that population in the United States. And uh, this slider bar actually slides their age. So you have five different dimensions here, right, to visualize. But that's uh, not uncommon. But what the key thing about here is, what happens if you have more data points than you have grid points? Let's just say if you have one, one trillion data points, but you have only one billion grid points. You end up with many points in the same location. So you use this piece of software called uh, Mindset to drag and reduce the transparency of the object. And those areas, the cloud that are persistent, means that they were denser. They had more points in it than others. So this is a, a way for you to deal with massive data, data that is orders of magnitude bigger than your graph. Right? So imagine if you build a graph that is 1,000 by 1,000 by 1,000. That's a billion grid points. Try to force a trillion points into that space. You end up with many points sitting in the same location, and you can't tell. And this uh, ability to drag and, and change the transparency, and those that persist will tell you that those areas are the ones with the most points. So you need tools like this to deal with big data. And we are building those tools. Yeah. And then lastly, um, for some lightheartedness, uh, it is not just a matter for big data visualization of just drawing. You have to understand visual perception well. Right? Let's use this example. This is a rectangle above a torus, a, a, a donut. Let me close that. This is a rectangle above the torus. Yeah? If I click on it, uh, let me see if I can get it going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's true. The rectangle is above the donut. Right? Let me close that and show you another example. Yes, this rectangle is above the donut, but if I show you another example, it looks just like that again, but guess what? When I move it, no. Right? But guess what? If I move it back again, after a while, you can't help yourself. Yeah, you close your eyes open again, you can't help yourself. You still think the rectangle is above the donut. You need to move it again to realize yourself, oh, no, no, I'm wrong again. Right? So, okay, the donut is, uh, cut off donut is above the rectangle, but if I move it back again, the eye can't help but to keep be drawn to the fact that uh, occlusion is a very powerful cue. Another example. This one, I need help from the audience, please. I think I did that once before. Uh, now, these are considered ridges that protrudes out to, from the screen, and these are considered uh, depressions that sinks into the screen. But please raise your hands when you see a change. Don't worry. Uh, different people see different things. It's all fine. Yeah. Raise your hands when you see a change. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's coming now. The rest are coming. Yeah? So, okay. Right. Eventually, all will get it. Now, tell me. If you had a greasy breakfast, uh, you feel, uh, oh, you feel, uh, can you still see it now that uh, we've moved here? Yeah. No? Some people feel uh, queasy because the slides skip a bit. So you cannot have infinite deceleration. Your eyes still tell you it's moving. Who still sees it's moving? Yeah, oh, yeah, in fact, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, anyone got a greasy breakfast this morning? No? <laughs> yeah, you don't want people to puke in front of your computer system, you know? Right? Uh, so, so these are things that we have to study and understand well uh, when it comes to big data visualization in a big uh, simulation room. 
and we are getting back into that area because big data is, customers in big data are pulling us back there. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, 600 people in Japan in 97 were admitted to hospital after watching the Pokemon a cartoon at 6 p.m. because they had these flashing lights uh, that cause uh, uh, some people to have a fit, right? So you have to be careful. Right? So broadcasters are now given a mandate that they, are not, uh, they have a certain rule, the 235 rule. If it is red, you can't flash more than two times a second. If it is not, you're allowed five. Uh, there are certain rules, right? That red in particular is a problem. Yeah, uh, when it's flashing too often. And lastly, uh, I'll just uh, show you this video. This one is one of my favorites. Yeah. This is an aircraft with a propeller, and some say it can take off without spinning the propeller. And indeed, huh? It's not spinning, right? Yeah, it's still not. Actually, it is spinning. This part is pretty, pretty interesting. There we go. Amazing video, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Basically, what happens is uh, a camera actually is not on all the time. The lens is open and then it closes, right? Yeah? So if you can time it right, when the propeller, when you open, the propeller is up there. And then when it, it then you close, and then it spins one round, and then you open at the right time, it didn't move. Yeah? Close again. Open your eyes. Oh, no, it didn't move. So that's how, what happened. If you can time it right, uh, it can create uh, illusions, right? But you don't want inadvertent illusions, right? Uh, and miscommunicate, and uh, uh, you know, cause miscommunication in big data visualization. So it is not just a matter of drawing. We have to be very careful, right? You can send the wrong uh, information to your, uh, to your, to your customers. Yeah. Uh, for those who are in Exascale, I will just add this part, yeah? Can I have another two, two minutes? Ten, ten, five minutes, yeah. I'll just add another uh, part to this, right? Uh, it is this. This is more for the exascale people. You all know that uh, data movement is going to be energy costly. And this is what happens uh, today. You create a big data in your simulation. You store it all on memory with a C program that has X, uh, Y, and Z, a model. Then after that, you print that, uh, that model out into, and store it onto a disk drive. It's 24 petabyte of I.O. And then after that, to visualize it, you read it back out from the disk drive into your separate system to do the visualization. So basically, you have uh, two copies of data, two extra copies of data, and you have done two I.O.s, and that probably costs you uh, a megawatt hour. Yeah, that's probably $100,000. Just to move that data out to a separate system and then read it back in to visualize, right? So that costs you $100,000. That's a megawatt hour. The whole idea of Exascale is to do in situ visualization where the Exascale needs the solution that you avoid the two copies and avoid the two IOs. Basically, you do the visualization inside there. Right? We're following a pattern around the idea for those in Exascale called print G, where you have print F to print text. Why can't you print G to print visualization without ever leaving the applications? And this is uh, something uh, for those interested, uh, we'd like to talk to you separately. Okay. That's visualization. And then finally, after all that effort, you decide. Go, no go, yes and no. One bit. Right? And exabyte comes in, you go through all that effort, and in the end, it's one bit that comes out. Yeah. <laughs> I exaggerate a bit. But essentially, this is what we are doing, right? For many of us. What we're doing here is to decide, is to do data reduction until we get the essence and Exabyte comes in, what comes out is, is there intelligent life, right, out there? For example, you plow through all that data and you get a signal, right? Or, yeah, or, or in, in other decision science, a lot of times it's down to that go, no, go. And I thought I'd bring up this uh, to just show you the interest. And then finally, don't forget, if you are a decision maker, please don't restrict your analyst to just one tool. There are options, yeah? especially if you want flexibility. And finally, uh, I thought I'd close by with this uh, more recent uh, development. Uh, the ultimate needle in a haystack machine, a quantum circuit machine. Yeah? I visited University of Waterloo. Canada is pretty strong here on that. Uh, that's a, a very cold refrigerator, close to zero Kelvin. The whole idea in quantum circuit is to lined up qubits 
so that they superimpose and entangle. And the power here is that if you have, if you have 64 qubits like that, instead of just storing one number, as in 64 bits, you will be able to process 8 zillion numbers in one go. The only problem is how long can you keep that thing entangled? And the world record today is to entangle only 14 qubits. Yeah. But it's still getting interesting. NASA is ordering uh, a separate system, very close, a place close to our HPC system. That's why I'm very keen, called a quantum annealing quantum computer. It's different in a sense that really a quantum annealer uh, is more like an analog quantum computer, a very rough way to say it, while a quantum circuit is a digital quantum computer. This one has 128 qubits. That's the reason why they can have 128. I mean, the world here record is only 14, but they have 128. But really, they do it in an analog way. If you, those who do uh, material science will know when you anneal a, a piece of metal, you do it slowly to try and soften that metal, right? Uh, this is called quantum annealer. I'm very keen. Uh, uh, you'll be at NASA Ames, uh, at NAS, uh, housed right below our supercomputer called Pleiades, and uh, we'll be uh, trying to work closely. And if this works, I'm not saying it, uh, currently today this machine uh, at a million dollars a pop is still slower than a PC, right? But it's, it gives you an early development system to find out what's going on. Uh, Google is interested, Lockheed Martin uh, is also interested, and so on. Right? But I thought I'd bring this up to say what the future could be maybe 10 years from now. On that note, thank you very much. <laughs>